Oh my god, you guys, one, one thing I need to say before we start this video. I have read every single comment you all have left on my part one video. I need to go back and love them, uh, like, love each comment. I have read every single comment, but the reason I didn't interact was because, and even up until now, I do not have the energy to write a message of thanks to each person, but I want to. I want desperately to. I have read through all these comments sobbing multiple times, feeling so much love and a sense of community and support and understanding. I want to write an individual message to every person who left a comment, but I am so exhausted and I'm so just overwhelmed by everything that I haven't been able to do it. So I'm going to go back after I upload this video and I'm going to at least love every comment to acknowledge it um, and hopefully I can come back at some point and write a, a message of thanks to each person but please from the bottom of my heart know that no medication in the world was as healing as reading those messages of love and support so thank you so so much Hey guys, um, it is Monday, October 23rd, and I'm just going to try to film this part two. <sighs> I've, I've tried filming this a couple times in the past, and I just haven't been able to get through it without hysterically crying. But yesterday, um, I actually managed to go a whole day without crying. Um, so I am like working through my grief and all of the associated emotions and I think maybe today could be the day that I could just film this video while the details are still fresh um, and just get through it. So I will put up a little warning that I, I will probably be graphic in this video. I will be talking about blood, blood loss, clots, pregnancy tissue, um, just explaining my experience with a medically managed missed miscarriage. And I may touch upon um, some of the emotional things that I've been dealing with in the aftermath if I make it that far into this video. And I also want to talk about some interesting side effects I experienced from taking these medications because when I was Googling about them, it was very hard for me to come up with much except for like Reddit threads and stuff like that. So I just thought I would talk about my whole experience. So if you have a light stomach or if this is not your cup of tea, um, go ahead and just pass over this video. But otherwise, if you were like me, finding yourself in this horrible position and trying to educate yourself on all the dirty details so that nothing surprised you or traumatized you when you went through it yourself, please know that I will be talking about my experience in a degree of detail that might be uncomfortable for some, but hopefully is informative for others. So um, where I left off in my part one video was when I was given the first round of medication, which is the Mifepristone. I, I don't know how you pronounce it, but it's the pill that you swallow, right? And from what I understand, I think that shuts down the remaining like progesterone production in the body so that um, your body will let go of the pregnancy it's holding. And so I took that in office on Thursday, October 12th. And um, um, one weird side effect that I experienced with this medication was that within 15 to 20 minutes of me taking this drug, my legs, particularly my calves, like my legs from the knee down, but really just all my knees, uh, sorry, all my, both my legs, all, all of, all of my legs, all parts of my legs <laughs> became extremely weak and shaky. Like I was holding on to both sides of the stairwell banisters when I was leaving the hospital I was holding on to both sides as I was going down the stairs. My legs felt very, very weak, like baby deer legs, like I could not support my own weight. Um, and when I Googled the side effects, it did say that like you should immediately contact your care provider if you feel unusually weak, 
fatigued, etc. I didn't feel, and, and I think it was because those could be signs of heavy bleeding, like internal bleeding or something. I didn't feel like anything was wrong in my body. So I didn't contact my care provider personally, but that is something I experienced very, very shortly after taking this Mifepristone medication. And then for about four days after that, starting from the day I woke, like the next day that I woke up, which was Friday the 13th, um, my calves felt like I had just spent an entire day running the stairs of the Empire State Building. My calves were so painful that I couldn't even touch them. It hurt to put clothing onto my legs. And it was just my calves. It was nowhere else on my legs, just my calves. I can't explain why that happened because obviously I was not working out. Um, the stairs that I did do at the hospital, it was just one, like one little staircase to get to the, it was like a half staircase to go up a half level. It was not anything to have made me feel sore. So I really feel like there was some muscle thing that went on there after taking the Mifepristone. But yeah, for several days I had um, pretty, pretty painful calves. And then also on, so, so the next step of this process for me was that 48 hours after I was given the oral tablet, I was to um, start the second round of this process. And so um, I took the oral pill on a Thursday and then on the, the next Saturday, two days later, I was told go to the bathroom in the morning and then insert vaginally four of these Cytotech tablets as f high up as you can go um, vaginally. And then three hours later, I was to take two more pills and put them under my tongue. And then three hours after that, I was to take two more Cytotec pills and put them under my tongue. And then I left them under my tongue for 10 minutes and then swallowed them. So in between these doses though, on the Friday, Friday afternoon at around two or 3 p.m., I started to get some mild menstrual cramps um, hold on guys. I'm going to let my dogs in. I started like having light menstrual cramps. I don't really get menstrual cramps. Um, I mean, I, I get them very, very mildly, but so, so that's like sort of what I was experiencing. And I started to have a lot of brown spotting, like a lot of it, but it was only brown. And so I was hoping that that would mean that the next day on Saturday, when I start the process of like dilating my cervix and like expelling the contents of my uterus. I was hoping it would be efficient because it seemed like things were already kind of starting to move and my body was kind of like getting a clue of what's going on. And so the next day on the Saturday, I used a pre-seed applicator um, because I figured that would be like the most hygienic way of getting these Cytotec pills up there. And they fit perfectly in the applicator. So I put four of them in the applicator and applied them and then I laid down on the couch and it was a Saturday, so unfortunately all my kids were home, but the good thing is my husband was home and he had his mom come too. His mom is a nurse. She works at the local hospital. And so she came with like all kinds of things for me, like Chuck's pads and adult diapers and things that I just didn't even plan for. I didn't even, like I knew how much blood that I, that was to be expected based off of all these other stories I'd heard and people I had talked to, but I just didn't even think to prepare myself anyway so thankfully she came with all that stuff and it came in very handy um and so i just laid on the couch and i expected for all of this to sort of start within 20 or 30 minutes because that's what a lot of people said they say in the pamphlet that it can take one to three hours to start but everyone i had heard was like yeah once they inserted the pills it just sort of like happened immediately and that was not my experience i went three whole hours, three and a half hours, no, three whole hours. And there was nothing. There was like no bleeding. There was no cramping. I just stayed on the couch the whole time. So after the first three hours, I took the first oral dose, which was when I, I put the two under my tongue and continued to lay on the couch for about 20 or 30 more minutes. And
then I realized I needed to use the restroom. So I got up. Now, mind you, I had not started cramping yet at all. So I got up and I sat down to go pee. And like I relaxed my pelvic floor to pee. And instead of pee, just an entire waterfall of blood and clots. Just... I had not had a single cramp and I didn't have a single drop of anything on my pad and didn't have any sensation that I needed to like pass anything when I sat down to use the toilet. So it caught me off guard. And for me personally, forgive me if this sounds gross, but I am uh, not grossed out by bodily things. And for me, for me, it felt very important to collect as much of the pregnancy tissue as I could because I wanted to bury it. I wanted to have a physical place I could go and visit my baby. I was horrified at the thought of flushing my precious baby down the toilet. I personally could never do that. And so when I passed these clots, I very willingly (laughs) threw my hands (laughs) into the toilet and grabbed like the main clot out and kind of like (laughs) lobbied it into the bathtub. And then I sat down and peed and the sink is right next to the toilet. So I'm washing my hands and I peed. And then I felt this distinct feeling that down there that perhaps another clot was going to come. So, um, finished up and immediately jumped into the bathtub and passed the next thing. And um, these two like first clots that I passed were about this big. And, um, and then I ended up spending the, the rest of my time miscarrying in the bathtub. I was just in an empty bathtub. I actually got this idea from someone else who was very brave enough as gross and graphic as it sounds for people like me, it was incredibly useful, but she, she was so brave. She filmed her entire missed miscarriage, like, and she picked up what was there and described the consistency. And for me, I know that sounds gross, but for me, it made it so much less confronting when I went through this myself, because I knew exactly what it would look like. I knew what it would feel like. I knew I was prepared. I knew all these things ahead of time and it just wasn't shocking or confronting to me. It felt um, very calm. And, and the way this woman, I will put the link to her video down below if you are the type who, who wants that kind of resource. The way she talked about it, it just felt very, she, she seemed so calm and honoring of her body and what was happening. And I don't know, it just... Uh, it made it possible for me to love on this experience. That's not the right way to describe it. It just made it much less traumatic, I think, and easier for me to feel okay to honor my body and my baby and everything that's going on by treating everything with respect, not being grossed out, not being scared, not being confronted but just treating this very practically and matter of factly. This was a part of my body. This was somebody. This was part of somebody and their life. And I'm not going to be scared or grossed out by it. So I cleaned off what I could and I determined that those two things were very much just blood clots. There was no substance to them at all. And so I just, uh, I ended up letting them pass. And, um, and... Then I went back to the couch and that's when I started to mildly cramp. I'm going to tell you guys though, I actually did not have any contractions through this process. Um, The cramping that I did have was less than what I normally get during a period, like substantially less. And I don't even really get period cramps. I hardly cramped at all. And the cramps that I did get, usually when I have menstrual cramps, I get them along my pelvic floor and sort of in in my front torso. But these ones I got in the small of my back, which is where I get my, all of my labor contractions is in the small of my back. So definitely the sensation felt like labor, um, although like the location of the sensations was labor oriented and not menstrual oriented, but I did not even need so much as a single Tylenol or Advil. It just, 
it just was nothing. Which sounds probably nice, but really I think it ended up being bad in a way because I don't think I responded properly to the cytotech. Um, and I'll, I'll explain why I say that in a second. So a whole nother three hours pass from my first oral dose. So three hours from the first oral dose, six hours from the original vaginal dose. And it got to be time for me to take another round of the oral. And I had two different versions of instructions. I had the instructions that were on the actual medication bottle, which just straight up said four vaginally, and then three hours later, take two orally, and then three hours later, take two orally. That's what it told me to do. But on the leaflet that the midwives gave me, it spelled it out a little bit more. And it was like, if you haven't started bleeding or cramping yet, then take this dose. And I wasn't sure what to do. Um, and so I decided to just take the second round of oral medication, even though I was very much heavily bleeding at this time. Every time I'd go to the bathroom, it would just be a waterfall of blood. Um, and, and again, I wouldn't go in the toilet. I would just go on my hands and knees in an empty, in my empty bathtub. And I had my shower handle going so I could like keep myself warm and clean, but not submerged. And it was pure liquid. It was no more clots after those first two clots. It was just a, a waterfall of blood coming out, but nothing that was to me scary or dangerous. And again, I never bled into a pad. It was like, it always stayed in until I got up and into the bathtub and like relaxed my body that it would finally just come out. <clears throat> I don't have to do that during a period when I'm on my period, like it just comes out, you know, I don't have to like focus on relaxing. So that was another like interesting difference between a heavy period and a miscarriage or labor. Like this process felt like labor. Like I needed to actively be involved in the expulsion of what was in me versus it just coming out on its own. Um, so anyway, I took that last round of medication and I, I did, I decided to do that because I hadn't seen anything come out of me that looked even remotely like pregnancy tissue or placenta. I just had those two things that I truly believed and still do believe were just blood clots. Um, there was no substance to them. It did that, you know, just, you know, um, and I wasn't cramping. So I just felt like I maybe needed to give my body that extra little push so I took those two pills orally, and then 20 minutes after that dose, um, I started to feel a shift. And this was when I did feel actual, like full uterine cramps. Again, so light that I didn't need a medication, but they were definitely there and they were coming with frequency. And I started to feel them along my pelvic floor. And I remember reading someone saying that when it came time to pass the pregnancy tissue, they felt themselves, they felt their contractions build up to pushing contractions. And then out came the thing and everything stopped, just like a mini version of labor. And so I'm like, you know, maybe that's what this is. I just had this uh, instinct to go into the shower and get on my hands and knees, relax a little bit, and then perhaps try to push. And so I did that and um, I relaxed, I relaxed everything. I was just on my hands and knees and a, like a lot of just liquid blood came out. By the way, I'm by my fire. So sorry um, if you are noticing that. <laughs> and, um, <clears throat> and then once the liquid stopped, I decided to just push a little and out came this, this um, pretty big disc. It had frayed edges. It did not seem like it had clean margins, um, but it was definitely not a blood clot. And if you think this is gross, skip ahead a few minutes, but I will describe to you, I'm not gonna show you, I didn't take pictures, but I will describe to you what it looked and felt like. It felt like a very, very firm um, gelatin type thing, um, much firmer than jello. I couldn't squish through it. Like it was definitely a solid, but it was translucent, um, not transparent, but translucent. It was like a whitish gray jelly like thing. And you could definitely see vasculature in it. So there were like veins, small, small veins going through it. And then there were clots in it and around it. Um, and I tried very, very desperately 
to feel around. I couldn't see through, but I tried to feel around, see if I could find the baby. From what I understand, the baby was only about the size of my pinky fingernail, so very, very small. I couldn't find it. I, I couldn't see through it. It was very, very tough. I couldn't, like squeeze it around or open it so I just washed it off I dried it off I put it in a jar and I put that jar in my freezer to preserve it and then after that I had no more cramps ever again that day and um, the pamphlet said that once you had passed everything your cramping would stop and then the bleeding should stop like the heavy bleeding and then it should just be like spotting on and off for a couple weeks um, but that's not what I experienced. I continued to bleed, not like I was during the, the miscarriage, but I was continually bleeding like I would on my heaviest period day. And I know that's all subjective. I happen to have very light periods. So to put it into context, I was having to change my pad like four or five, sometimes six times a day, including through the night. Um, I was still bleeding, what I would consider heavily, but not anywhere near the danger zone where they say, like, if you're bleeding through two pads in one hour, like two big pads in one hour, then go to the hospital. I was just using normal, normal menstrual pads, not the big ones, just the normal ones. And they were not even soaking through. I just, you know, you get to a point where it's like, okay, I'm going to change it. Um, and I was still continually passing small clots about this can you see that? About this big. Just small, small clots. Um, and so I was like, okay, well, this process took a little bit of time, so I bet that it will, it will have resolved by tomorrow on Monday. And no, I continued to bleed what I consider quite heavily and constantly around the clock on Monday, on Tuesday, and on Wednesday. Now, I had an ultrasound scheduled for what I thought was Thursday. It turned out to be Friday. But it, at the time, I thought it was Thursday. So I said to myself, as long as I don't feel like a lot of pain or the bleeding doesn't become more or I don't start passing bigger clots or so long as I don't run a fever and have signs of infection, you know, I'm just going to wait until Thursday for my ultrasound and then they will be able to help me and tell me what to do. And I never had any of those, those bad signs. It just was steady, heavy, heavy bleeding, small, small clots. And no pain until I'd say Monday evening. Then I started to occasionally get just the tiniest, tiniest cramp. It would be totally subconscious if I wasn't very focused on that part of my body. Um, like if this was just a normal period, I wouldn't even have probably become aware of it. It was that light. But then on Tuesday, I had some like maybe slightly stronger, um, minor period type cramps throughout the day, like sort of in the morning and then in the evening again. And then on Wednesday, they had picked up to being like normal menstrual cramps, especially in the evening. And I remember telling my husband, like something is not right because I am at this point, this many days post Cytotech, I am bleeding very heavily. Like it should be letting up a little bit and it's not. And I started passing bigger clots and so I'm like, something is not right. So later on in that evening on Wednesday, I pulled up the paper that said when my ultrasound was because I just wanted to get prepared for it and stuff. And I learned that my ultrasound was actually not until Friday. It wasn't on Thursday. It was Friday morning. And I was like, oh, shoot, I'm going to have to wait a whole extra day. And I wasn't I wasn't sure what to do. I didn't know if I should call them and reschedule, but I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm still not showing signs of infection. I don't feel lightheaded, like I've lost too much blood or whatever. I'm just going to wait it out. So ironically, right after I found that paper, I went to the bathroom. I just had to pee and I had my phone with me. And so I had sort of hunched over and I was just scrolling on my phone. And when I was done, I put my phone down and I sat up to wipe and out of nowhere, just bloop, like this huge something fell out of me. And I was like, oh my God. So once again, like I would much rather stick my hand into 
a dirty toilet bowl and pick out what could potentially be my baby than the thought of flushing my baby down the toilet bowl. I personally was never going to flush my baby. And I didn't want to like go grab a spoon or some sort of kitchen utensil and fish it out. That didn't seem like a good choice at the time. So I just reached in and I grabbed what had come out and went to the sink and I'm not gonna lie my stomach was turning my stomach was turning a little bit on this one I tried very hard to be scientific and practical and honor my baby and honor my body and not see these things as confronting or gross or anything but oh I can't say this was a very fun experience but I stuck my hands under the faucet and washed off um, what it was, and it was like this, uh, it was this solid mass. It looked like my fist, but just half the size of my fist. It really, like, looked like a fist, and it <clears throat> was very, very, very solid. It almost felt like muscle, you know? Um, I didn't mess around with it much. I didn't try to examine it, because it really, I'm not gonna lie, it grossed me out. Um, it just kind of, yeah, I don't know. But I washed it, I dried it, I set it aside, washed my hands, went to the freezer, got my freezer jar, went back into the bathroom, put it in the freezer jar, and just put the jar back in the back of my freezer. I still haven't had my burial yet, I just wanted to wait until everything was over with. But anyway, that happened. And then after that moment, all of the like violent bleeding just completely stopped. And it's now the following Monday. This was last week on Wednesday. I had my ultrasound on Friday and I don't know if I have the energy to to talk about that appointment. It was a good appointment. Um, I got a lot of information from them, but there were two student doctors that attended this appointment, which I just think was in bad taste. I don't know, like, I I take that back. It wasn't in bad taste because doctors need to be educated and they need to be exposed to people like me who are going through grief. Um, it just, and I'm, I'm all for like helping students and stuff. I always say on my birth plans that I'm happy to have students come and like test out and check my cervix and stuff, whatever, because they do need to learn. But it just was such a fragile and vulnerable time. And I was still like very, very deep in my grief. And it was confronting to have like an audience and have to talk about all of this. And the main doctor asked me, you know, how to, to describe how I, how my, how it went. And so I did, and, and I told her everything. And then she asked me some questions about how I was doing emotionally and psychologically and um, had a complete breakdown. Um, I don't have the energy to talk about it right now, uh, but I guess that detail is not necessary to know. And she gave me a pamphlet for the um, loss therapist at the hospital, who I was going to call today, but I I haven't yet. Um, Because I do do very much believe I need a mass amount of therapy, and I don't want to run away from this opportunity to get therapy, because after everything I've been through, I need therapy. But anyway, um, and then they went on to do the physical examination, and they like... Um, used the speculum to look, I think, at my cervix and see, like, examine things. And then they did the internal ultrasound and they checked my cervix, they checked my uterus, they checked my ovaries, and, like, the doctors kind of used me as, like, this... I don't think it was necessary to check my ovaries, but she's like, okay, I want you to find the right ovary. Now I want you to find the left ovary. And no, 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 it's better to hold it this way instead of this way. And she just was not comfortable. But whatever, I just just dealt with it. Um, 
but she showed me on the ultrasound that I still had like this, this is like this white, you could see the uterus, but then like inside of it, there was like this white tissue. And she told me that that was still something that needed to come out. Like she, like just blood, I guess. She said that it, everything looked fine. Like it didn't look like there was retained tissue or anything. So I assume it was just like some menstrual lining, whatever that still needed to come out. And I have continued to bleed, but very, very, very lightly. And it's, um, yeah, <clears throat> it's like, uh, you know, after you have a baby, if you've had a baby, you get through that first original crazy amount of bleeding. And then it's just sort of like, um, sometimes it can be like a clear pink tinged stuff that comes out sort of like a, a watery type. It's not just like pure blood. That's sort of like what's coming out now. Um, and, and a few like small, 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 small clots. So, yeah, everything was fine, and I got the clear to um, continue uh, to to start up um, physical activity if that's something I feel up for. But she told me I can't bathe or you know have intimacy or whatever like that for a couple more weeks. I do expect to be spotting and bleeding a little bit for a couple more weeks. So that was that, and then um, this is absolutely going to be my last experience with pregnancy because I am completely broken. And I don't ever, ever, ever want to go through this ever again. And I know that, um, you know, if we were to just keep trying, eventually something would probably stick and be healthy and, you know, this, this, that, and whatever. But I have absolutely chosen to not um, continue. Um, the pregnancy was devastating on me. And the loss was also absolutely devastating. And the two have compounded each other. And I have so much, just like an impossible amount of guilt of the fact that I spent my entire pregnancy in a state of doom and dread and anxiety and then once I finally started to feel better, I had to go through an enormous loss and just realizing that for all those beautiful weeks that my baby was with me, I spent it in just complete turmoil when I should have been so, so happy. Um, <clears throat> the whole experience is just, I'm so deep in grief right now and I guess maybe this shows my privilege that I think I may have only experienced grief two other times in my life besides now. And even those were very minor cases of just really bad heartbreak, really bad heartbreak. Um, <clears throat> so maybe grief isn't the right word for that because this actually feels much, much different. Um, I, I'm sort of in uncharted territory and feeling so many things so authentically. Um, I cry a lot at inappropriate places and times. Um, the silliest and ra most random things make me think of my baby. For instance, I was sitting by the fire two nights ago and our wood, as you guys all know, the wood saga... Um, our wood is not perfectly dried out. It's still, some of it is moist. And when you burn um, logs that have moisture in them, the steam, there's like steam that builds up in the logs and then it like pops, pops out. That's what makes that crackling noise, I think, when you, when you burn wood. And when the steam like pops out, it shoots embers everywhere. And the embers are kind of like, you know, those sparklers, sparkler, um, firecrackers where you can like move it all around and it leaves this tail of light um, as you move the sparkler uh, sparkler around that's what these embers did you know just crazy amounts of little embers that lit left these beautiful tails of light squiggly tails of light and two nights ago that happened and I was sitting here with my daughter and we were watching it happen and I just immediately burst into tears because these beautiful burning embers with these tails of light, they look like sperm to me. 
And then I was immediately flashed back to the day when I was one DPO and I was meditating myself to sleep, just meditating and dreaming and envisioning um, swimmers finding the eggs and fertilizing the egg. And like, I would just meditate on this every night to put me to sleep. Well, what could be happening exactly right now in this moment? And, and I just thought back to that moment because it happened. I'm not going to cry. I'm too tired to cry. Songs. Songs that come on the radio and all of a sudden it's like every single lyric of every song is a message to me of what I'm feeling, how I'm feeling, the grief I'm feeling. Um, Smells places. The bathtub is still a very hard place for me to be in and not because I miscarried in it, but because I spent so much of my pregnancy in that bathtub. Um, Having to pack things away like the Doppler. Um, It's just all kinds of things that... trigger very strong, sudden memories. Um, I joined a a really awesome group called the Worst Girl Gang for miscarriage and baby loss. And in that group, someone said that they heard a song from one of their favorite Disney movies and it suddenly spoke to them so strongly and they shared the lyrics. And it was the... um, um, the Cinderella song, A Dream is a Wish Your Heart Makes. And I read the lyrics of that song, and it's like I had never heard them before. And suddenly it was like, oh my God, this song is a miscarriage song. It struck me so hard that I feel like I want to get one of the verses tattooed on me. But of course, that song is about continuing to try and believe in your dream. And that is very confronting also because I'm choosing not to try anymore. Um, And I'm experiencing a lot of negative self-talk and guilt and beating myself up, telling myself I've quit on my baby, my baby who I whispered prayers to every night that I was coming. I was coming for them and I was going to get them and I was going to bring them to our family no matter how I had to, hard I had to try and no matter how many miscarriages I would have that I would come for them. And now in a moment of weakness I've decided I just can't do that anymore. I feel a great amount of guilt for that. I feel like I've betrayed my baby. Um, I blame myself for this all the time. I blame myself that it's something I did. It was a medication I was on. Maybe it was just my stress and anxiety and panic attacks that killed the baby. Um, (gasps) Cortisol release in a panic attack causes inflammation. Inflammation can cause, I don't know, maybe blood clots or constricted vessels. I blame myself all the time and... No matter how many times people say it's not my fault and these these things happen and and blah, 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 I'll never know. I'll never know the truth. And so I'm the type of person who would just sooner blame myself than try to come up with some other explanation. So that's where I'm at right now. I'm just very, very deeply in a state of grief and processing, and I very badly need therapy but I'm still so overwhelmed and I'm so exhausted and, um, and I'm so sad. I'm just so sad that sitting down and having to talk to someone, even sitting down and doing this video, look at me, I'm exhausted. I'm ready for a nap right now. I'm so tired. Um, But I made a post on my Instagram page finally yesterday, just very lightly opening up about where I'm at mentally and emotionally. And 
I'm, whether I like it or not, I'm in the very beginning stages of a healing journey and I need to find joy in life again. I need to find the good in life again because Lord knows I am so blessed. I am so, so blessed. I have three whole entire young children, healthy, um, that fill my house with laughter and fun and energy. And I'm so thankful for them. Um, my hands are more than full. My heart is more than full. And I do feel and recognize all of those things. I don't take any of it for granted. But I need to walk through this journey of grief, process what's happened, learn to navigate this negative self-talk and guilt and blame. And I need to come alive again, eventually. I need to come alive again. There's a time for crying and grieving, and I'm in that right now, but I also recognize that it's not healthy to dwell in this place, especially when I'm beating myself up, needlessly. So the best way I know how to do a healing journey is to start with focusing on my health, my wellness, um, basic things. So since last Thursday, I have forced myself to walk my dogs for a half hour each day, rain or shine. I have forced myself to do it. And it's, it's very, very helpful, especially when I'm in like the deep, deep sads and I'm crying uncontrollably. It, it very much um, snaps me out of it. And I have started with drinking one and a half liters of water each day. I have a 700 milliliter um, protein shaker drink that I drink uh, two of those a day. And that's where I've started. Um, Getting my water in, making sure I take my medications, my, my thyroid medications on time. And walking for 30 minutes each day. Um, it's a very big challenge to do those things, but I'm doing them and I feel very, very proud. And what my hope is that it will kind of start to give me a little bit of energy, um, also to start focusing on a cleaner diet, a healthier diet, getting my fruits and vegetables in, cooking again, um, not relying on processed things because I I don't have the motivation to cook. So I'm slowly goose-stepping myself toward um, getting back into fitness and health. And I'm at ground zero. I have gained a substantial amount of weight during this whole pregnancy and loss. Um, Originally, I wasn't eating much at all. And then I just, once I found out that the baby didn't have a heartbeat, I just started eating my grief and just saying, F- it, you know, like anything, anything that doesn't sound, doesn't make me nauseous. That sounds like I can eat. I'll eat it without shame. Burger King, McDonald's, pizza, didn't matter. Sitting down with a tub of ice cream. I did that once. I don't even like ice cream. Um, so I have, a, I have a lot of body work to do and mind work and soul work. And so this video is super long. I'm going to end it here. But when I come back, when I'm ready to, I guess I'll probably do like my measurements and just sort of talk about the things I'm doing to work my way through this sadness and grief and ultimately this big life decision that we're done building our family. And this is the note we're ending it on. Um... Because I I plan to try to do things, you know, even if I don't want to do them. Try them out and see if I can't find. I need like a passion and a hobby again. I need something that brings me joy, personal joy, you know. I mean, obviously my kids and family bring me joy. (laughs) That goes without saying. But I also, I need like a hobby or something. So 
Anyway, thank you for listening. I'm not going to edit this. I'm not going to refilm this. I'm done. I'm going to export this now. I'm going to slap my intro and outro onto it, and I'm going to upload it so that I can move on from this chapter. I feel like I touched upon everything, the experience, the side effects, sort of a description of the grief I'm going through, and my first baby next steps into my healing journey, which I I am going to share on this channel, mostly to keep me accountable. Um, Yeah, so I'm so tired, you guys. I'm going to go now, but I will talk to you all soon. Okay, bye.